It was 5.15 yesterday afternoon, and I was wandering around in no man's land, not exactly sure uh, what I was to get, nor was I extremely proficient or efficient at making that determination. For I found myself in the supermarket looking for food, all of which I consume and rarely shop for. I like it that way. And I was thinking, now, what is it that I should take for a supper that is going to feature breakfast food? And I thought, well, tater tots are a no-brainer. They, 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 you know, even guys can figure that out. You throw them in the oven, they come out nice, hot, and crispy, and you eat them like they're candy. And then I wondered, well, that's probably not quite enough. Pizza came across my mind. And I said, well, that sounds good, but is it really breakfast food? Well, it depends upon who's doing the cooking and what grade you're in. I had many pizzas that were leftovers from the night before when I was in college. But I thought, mm, maybe not. So I struggled a little bit. I thought, well, let's see. There's tater tots, bananas. That's breakfast food, almost a no-brainer. And got to have something sweet. So I went in search for sweet rolls or something like that. Couldn't find any sweet rolls. The closest I came to something sweet was a cherry pie. Sounded good to me. Off I scurried for breakfast at supper. I walked in. It was a small group, three or four that were setting up. I said, well, as I opened the door and went humbly in, I already smelled tater tots in the oven, the smell wafting its way to my nostrils. I said, well, there's strike one. We'll add to the group, though. If nothing else, we'll have plenty of tater tots. I left the bananas with the ladies that were working on the food, and I left the cherry pie in hopes that something would come forth from the kitchen. Now, I'm a guy, and while I love to eat, I don't do so well in that place called kitchen. I kind of drop it off and wait to see what comes forth. As I visited with some of the guests, it was a wonderful occasion. Now, let me just add, if you have not been to the thing that's called Breakfast for Supper, which meets on the second Friday of the month, which Friday? The second Friday. And you've been waiting for your, your invitation and your reservation? You've been invited. You don't need a reservation. You just stop by and pick up something that you think is breakfast food, and it's called one of those things. It's a potluck. What comes out of the, the pot depends upon the luck that you bring. And the ladies work on it, and they, they kind of do their magic, and you have the opportunity to meet some new friends, to get better acquaint. One of the things that I really like about it is the time that we spend together. We had about 15 people there last night, and we got acquainted around the tables for the first little bit. We spent some time in fellowship, uh, some singing and vespers, and then we were all cleared out no later than 8 o'clock. Not a lot of commitment on your part. What day of the month is it? What day? It's the second Friday of each month. Mark it on your calendars and be there. They rotate who does the guest devotional. any rate, I tell you this story only to suggest that I held my breath. I smelled for about the first 20, 25 minutes the fragrance of tater tots wafting its way from the kitchen into the dining area where we meet, where we meet and I was sitting getting acquainted with people. And I said, it's good, God. I know what we're going to have tonight. We're going to have tater tots. And I like them. And maybe they added, added the ones I brought. Maybe they didn't. But the fellowship has already been a feast. 
And so it was time to have a blessing uh, on our fellowship together and on the food, so that was offered. And out of that kitchen, I just couldn't believe it. What came forth? What do you think came forth? Of course, tater tots. Something else came forth. There were sweet rolls. There was a big bowl of eggs. There was a fruit plate of fresh fruit. There was even cherry pie and sliced up bananas and some other things that I partook of that were excellent indeed. It was a bit of a miracle. I don't know how it happened. I don't know how whatever came in came out so well. But thank you, ladies. That food was transformed. That feast happened. We brought what we could, and we enjoyed a wonderful meal together. You want to see how that works? What day of the week is it? Friday, the second Friday of the month. Now, why do I share that with you? I share it with you because I believe it illustrates how God blesses what we bring to him. And our message today from John chapter 3 talks about that transformation that takes place. I'd invite you to open your Bibles to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We find there the story of Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night, and we have to understand this story in its setting in context to really catch the flavor of it and the nuances of it. It almost seems sometimes that the Bible is a little bit one story after the other, and we isolate it without understanding it in the greater picture of the stream of the stories that are going on in the book of John. But when we understand it in context and link it to the stories that preceded it and the stories that will follow it, it gains a little more flavor and meaning. There are two primary teachings in this story in John chapter 3. It's a story of living and experiencing life and living and experiencing life in the Spirit of God. For we all experience life in the flesh. But is that all there is? Is there something more that God wants us to experience? So let's look by way of context and understand the story that God is speaking to John as he's writing at the end of his life. And God is telling John, here are some of the things that I want you to write about. Now, if I were writing at the end of my life, I would be tempted to probably write about personal revelations and my experience with God. Now, John is writing about, of all the things he could write about, he's writing about this man named Nicodemus. Interesting that he chose that story to write about. More interesting is the fact that that story written 2,000 years ago is kind of a capstone many times when the gospel is shared. When the gospel is shared with others, the story of Nicodemus often comes up. I don't think that John really knew the significance that of this story as it would have down through the corridors of time and its application to the millions of lives that have been touched by it. So let's look there in John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews that came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, and no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Straightforward enough. Unless you're reborn, Nicodemus, you won't be able to see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into a second time into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 
Jesus was making it very clear and plain and simple. Unless you are born of the Spirit, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. Now, now realize the context in which he is speaking this to Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, one who was knowledgeable and educated in religious things. Sometimes the greatest people that struggle with their relationship with God are those who are well-educated in the things of God. Did you catch that? How can that be? The more you know about the Scriptures, sometimes you struggle with it. So wise in the things of God, but yet experientially so void of the experience of God. Can you be knowledgeable and void of experience? Can you be knowledgeable in the fleshly way of living, but yet when the experience of God comes calling and the Spirit of God comes calling, you say, how does all of this happen in real life? Such was Nicodemus's case. He was well-educated in, uh, in the Jewish faith. He was a ruler among the Jews, so much so that he was afraid to acknowledge Christ publicly. He went to Christ at night, seeking to have a private audience with Christ, wanting to get on track and get the inside way of experiencing a relationship with him. Now, you have to understand the context here of exactly what is going on in terms of timing and the presentation that uh, this story finds itself in the greater context of John. We looked in John chapter 2 just last week of two stories, and just touching on them, two stories, the miracles, <clears throat> excuse me, the miracle of Jesus in turning water to wine, a miracle of transformation, followed immediately by the cleansing of the temple and the linking of those two in understanding the sacredness and the ordinary. How Jesus took that which was ordinary, water, and turned it into something miraculous, wine at the wedding. And mankind often takes that which is sacred and turns it into ordinary, the key teachings of John chapter 2. Now when you understand the story of Nicodemus against that background, you will find that Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, understood, as Jesus was te teaching, he understood what it meant that he needed to have a deeper relationship with Jesus. But he had also understood in that context that Jesus had just cleansed the temple. And for a Jew to understand that Jesus drove out everybody from the temple because they had um, desecrated the temple by their buying and selling and taking the holy place and turning it into a commonplace market, Nicodemus wanted a private setting with Jesus. And he brought the question to Jesus, how is it that a man who is old can be born again? Have you ever asked questions of God and said, Lord, how does this relationship with you work? And Jesus said, that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not, in verse 7, marvel not that I said this unto you, you must be born again, because the wind blows where it wants, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but you cannot tell whence it comes and whether it goes. So it is with everyone that is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus asks a second question, and answered him and said unto Jesus, How can these things be? Now Nicodemus has asked Christ two questions. Now Christ, very fittingly, responded with the question. Jesus answered and said unto him, Thou art a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily I say unto you, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen and received not our witness. If I had told you of earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things. I've spoken of earthly things to you, Nicodemus. You have told me already that you realize I have the ability to do miracles. As Nicodemus was introducing his questions to Christ, he said, I realize that, Master, you are a good teacher. 
I realize the miracles that you've done already. So from a rational, logical, fleshly standpoint, he should, he's already acknowledging Christ's divinity to do miracles. But he's missing the link between doing miracles to the realization that Jesus is just not a good teacher. He indeed is the Son of God standing before him. How smart some people are to realize that Jesus is indeed, indeed the Son of God, but without realizing his claim on their life. I don't get it sometimes. Do you? And we have to say, do we ever fall into the thinking of Nicodemus? On one hand, wanting the blessings of God without fully experiencing the Spirit of God, living the fleshly side of life without fully experiencing the Spirit of God. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, verse 11, we speak that we do know, of that which we do know, and testify that we have seen and we received not our witness. If I had told you earthly things and you believe them not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no man hath ascended to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the ser serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Eternal life, everlasting life. Jesus was forecasting the day that he would die on the cross and be lifted up, and those that believed on him would have eternal life. And Nicodemus was puzzled by that. He was tormented and puzzled. Now, mind you, Nicodemus, Nicodemus had a heart that was seeking God, and God honored that. If you have the book Desire of Ages, I'd invite you to when you go home this afternoon, to pick it up and read pages 172, 171, 172, 173. It describes the spiritual walk of Nicodemus. How when he had experienced this exchange with Christ, something stirred in his heart. That as the early church was formed, Nicodemus' heart was opened, and he gave of his worldly goods to the early church. It was Nicodemus that came forth and begged for the body of Jesus that he might be laid in the tomb. It was Nicodemus who had a sensitive side to spiritual things, but yet had trouble acknowledging the same. How is it in your life today, friends? You may realize the calling of God. You may realize the desire of God's on your heart in life today. There is a, a chapter that I would like to marry to John chapter 3. Because while we look at the story of Nicodemus, we find there the struggle that Nicodemus has in the flesh of understanding the Spirit. We're going to put alongside John chapter 3, Romans chapter 8. Okay, Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, we find there the second part of this message. What does it mean to live and walk according to the Spirit of God? Romans chapter 8, Paul in his writing says, There is now, this is the hope that we have as we believe in Christ. There are three parts to our message today. The part of walking and experiencing the fleshly life that we have the part of walking in the Spirit and living by the Spirit, and then we're going to come back to John chapter 3 momentarily. This, in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, this is therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but what? After the Spirit. No condemnation to those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ made me free from the law of sin and death. For that which the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending in his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, 
and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but what? After the Spirit. I like this text. I like this text because it proclaims so clearly that if we are going to walk after the Spirit of God, His Spirit will be with us. That our salvation does not come through our attempt to walk on our own through the journey of life. But our, our Spirit is filled by the Spirit of God, and He empowers us through His Holy Spirit to journey through life and be victorious over the temptations that Satan brings to us week after week, day after day, I get tired of the temptations that Satan hurdles my way. I get tired and discouraged at times with what life has to bring to me. And when I get tired enough and struggle enough, a little bulb comes on in my mind, I need to turn these all over to Christ and place them before the Spirit of God and ask the Spirit of God to fill my heart and life. And when I do that, I remember this verse that the Spirit gives us victory when Satan comes calling. Do you believe that, friends? Underline it in your Bible. If you forget everything you learned today, but you remember two passages of Scripture, John chapter 3 and Romans chapter 8, you'll be able to face Satan in every temptation and be victorious. Do you believe that, friends? I do. It's not by my authority. It's by the authority of the Word of God. It's not by accident that he penned these words. It's for today's living and today's believer. 2,000 years old, well tested by the stream of human history, well tested by time. These words are just as powerful today as the day they were originally inked. The Spirit of God, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that, uh, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is, do you know what that passage says? Is life and, what does your Bible say? Life and peace. To be spiritually minded is to experience life and peace. Underline it. Star it. Take it home. Memorize it. When you're struggling with life, when you're saying, where do I go from here? I just got laid off. Where do I go from here? I was just betrayed by a best friend. Where do I go from here? I just yielded to sin. Wait a minute. To be filled by the Spirit is to be like-minded with Christ, spiritually minded, and it's life and it's peace. When your life is struggling, when your life is filled with turmoil, when your life is filled with anxiety, step back and take a time out. I call it, be still and know that I am God. Take a, take a time out to go to the place of stillness and say, Lord, your spirit has been promised, and I want to claim that promise of life in you and the peace that you bring. Because the carnal mind is an enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God indwell you, dwell in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So how does this work in a real practical way? How do we move from living in the flesh to living in the Spirit? How does that transformation, how does that being filled with the Spirit actually happen in a practical way? I'm not sure. When you look outside, we don't have a lot of wind out here. I lived in Colorado. You couldn't miss the wind coming off the hills. 80 miles an hour, it would come, come off the mountains and blow across. We lived next to a lake. It had come across the lake 
And when it was blowing 80 miles an hour, you knew it was windy. You could be in the house and you'd hear the, the whole house kind of creak. Uh, a couple of minutes later, the same thing. And uh, you'd go down to the lowest floor in your house and you would do your Bible study down there. If the house uh, left on top, you know, left its foundation, you'd still, you'd still be safe in the basement. You can't capture the wind. You can't will the wind to happen. Then again, you can't stop the wind. And when God moves in your life, whether it's a gentle breeze or whether it's a strong wind, it's his work, not yours. So when the troubles come, just call out, breathe on me, breath of God, ever so gently. By your spirit, fill me with life anew, and he will do it. So I shared with you a little illustration. Let's see from yesterday. It was food into the kitchen. Miracle came out. It was a feast. Now, guys can't relate to that. Well, excuse me. Some of you are very good cooks in the kitchen. So that was overstated. Let me use an illustration uh, for the guys. It worked something like this. I believe his name was Carol Shelby. Anybody heard of him? Any of you ladies heard of him? Any of you guys heard of him? Okay, a few. Uh, 68, 69 Mustangs, 350 Shelbys in there. Yeah, good, good race car builder. If you went into his garage and you saw pistons all around the floor, you know, and uh, chunks of metal over here, and uh, you walk in and you go, this place is a mess. Ladies go, what are we doing here? You know, I've got really no interest here. But you leave him alone in that garage, okay? He's going to take all those pistons, and he's going he's gonna to mill all those heads, bore the block, put in oversized rods, high compression, and all of that kind of good stuff that just gets the, uh, <clears throat> sometimes the male hearts beating a little faster. And those that like, like to go fast can understand what I'm saying. He was not going to just create a normal engine by his own skills. He was going to create a specially modified engine that would go faster than anything you've ever driven. Leave him alone for a while in that garage. And it was all just metal strewn across the garage floor. But when he put his hands and his wrenches together while you were out of that garage and dropped that engine in that hood, it was a sight to behold. And it was just waiting to be driven. You know when that food came out of the kitchen, it smelled great. Didn't do anybody any good until it was eaten. That car rolls up to the edge of the garage. Want to drive it? Want to go with it? Want to put the key in it? Want to take off? Doesn't do any good to look at it. Oh, I, I can picture myself putting my, my key into that engine, turning it, hearing that boom. I've got my foot on the gas. I'm ready after about a minute and a half of that idling. Just put me on the track and turn me loose. Put my foot into it and around that track I go. There's no more fleshly living in the bystander stands watching somebody else. It's, I got to go experience it. You can smell that food. It does no good until you put it in your mouth and taste it. You can look at that engine all dis uh, disassembled on that garage floor. And when the miracle transformation at the hands of a master puts it all together, he's waiting. He's waiting for you to grab hold because that spirit inside of you is going to be turned free. And you're going to go for on a ride for your life. I can't wait for that to happen. Can you? One more passage, John chapter 3, verse 16. One that you know very well. One that you know very well. One that, one that you know very well, and you have heard many sermons about, which we will disassemble and assemble again at another time. 
But against all of this background, John pens the words, For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. So let me look at that just for two minutes and anchor our thoughts in that. Notice the words just for a few minutes. For who is the subject of this thought? For who? For God. God of the universe. So what? So loved. Here is a holy God that loved a world in rebellion. Here is a God who loved the world enough. So God so loved the what? The world. It's interesting. It's not by accident that that word was chosen. I like it because it's all inclusive. It doesn't say God just loved the believers. It doesn't say God just loved those who are attending church. It doesn't say God just loved those who graduated from high school and were believers, or those who were short, or those who were tall, or those who had a right understanding of theology. It says God so loved the world. And the world is full of people who are different than you and I. And the good news is his love is poured out upon them. The better news is his love includes me. His love includes you regardless of your unique situation. So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's interesting, his character. He so loved the world. He didn't stand off and say, well, they'll figure it out. He didn't stand off and say, I'll do something. No, the nature of God, he so loved that he gave. There is no love without giving. You can't love somebody without expressing it. It has to come out. It's a living peace. God so loved the world, he gave his most treasured thing in the universe, his only begotten son. It would be different if he had a family of five or six or ten or fifteen. That would be a token offering. That would be something, well, I've got six... um, I know I'm going to resurrect him. Uh, He'll come forth. He gave his only begotten son. That what? Whosoever believeth on him should not perish. How big is the whosoever? Whosoever means you. Whosoever means me. So the passage is, he gives his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. What a message in John chapter 3. We live so often in the flesh, and the Spirit of God calls us into a relationship with him. And as we go forward, we go forward not as the hopeless, We go forward with our hearts filled with hope, with a message that if we believe in Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. Not then, but now. We live in the Spirit now, and one day we will see him face to face. What a message that we have to share with a perishing world. Oh, that we might be transformed as Christ has invited us to be, moving from living in the flesh to walking in his spirit and living in the spirit and realizing his love and his blessing. May that be your experience today is our prayer.